My name is Graham Daniels. Um, I am a back-end engineer at Grovo in New York. Um, I am a father. I'm the author of the Code Manifesto, a member of the PHP League and the PHP FIG Core Committee. I'm the US lead for PHP Women, and you can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet at GREYDNLS, Twitter, GitHub, what have you. Today, we're going to be talking um, about the Code Manifesto. So what to expect? We'll be talking a lot about community and diversity and inclusion, what the problem is, why it matters, and what we can do to help. Now, there are some things that I won't cover, uh, but they are important enough that they warrant talking about. Um, so different types of diversity. I primarily in this talk will talk about um, gender diversity and um, mental health diversity. Uh, there are lots of other different kinds of diversity that exist out there. The ones that I speak about are just the ones that I have the most experience with. Uh, that doesn't make the ones that I omit any less important. They're definitely not omitted on purpose just because I don't have a lot of personal experience with them. There's also the concept of intersectionality, which I won't talk on for similar reasons. So why am I talking about this? Um, I've given this talk probably I don't know, half a dozen times. Um, this is my third time giving it since transitioning. Um, I'm a trans man, so I spent the majority of my life and the majority of my career um, as a woman in tech. Um, and this is really important. I felt what it's like on both sides of it. Um, and I know exactly like how important it is and why it's important to talk about. So what is the problem? In a nutshell, our industry is grossly lacking in diversity. The minority people that we get into our, 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 diverse, bleh, <coughs> our industry are pushed out, either by overt, oppression or overt discrimination or just day-to-day -day life. This problem, I think, is twofold. There is a pipeline problem, uh, and there's a culture problem. A lot of people will stop at the culture, or stop at the pipeline though, and they'll point to the pipeline and say the pipeline is the issue, the pipeline is the problem, and that completely ignores the culture problem. Stopping at pipeline means that it's somebody else's problem to fix. I don't need to fix my culture, I don't need to fix what women and minorities face in our industry today and every day, because it's just, they're not coming. There's, there's no inflow, so it's not my problem. And that's irresponsible. Talking about the pipeline, Figures say that 12% of computer science degrees go to women. Um, and you'll have to forgive me, these are American stats uh, because I'm from America. Um, the stats in Europe are not much different though. And then if you look at these diagrams, um, I have them labeled as race and gender with no breakdown. And that would be because you probably don't need a breakdown. I would assume that most of you can guess what those big red Pac-Man looking segments are. For Facebook, Twitter, Google, Apple, Microsoft, all of the biggest players in our industry, and this is what diversity looks like. Coincidentally, it's not much different for smaller companies, for the record. They don't post their diversity stats, but it's not much different. Um, I have worked on a number of different teams, the majority of teams that I've worked on, with one exception. Um, I was the only woman on the team. So this is pretty standard in our industry. But are these problems or are they symptoms of problems? I would say a little bit of both, but when talking about the, the pipeline issue, we can consider them symptoms. We can go further back. I have three children. I have two boys uh, and a girl. And these are, the these are the toys that my boys are presented with. These are the things marketed to boys. And they are amazing. I want to play with these toys. My boys want to play with these toys. I have one son that's intensely addicted to Legos. And for any of you who have girl children or have gone into the girl children section of the store, you are hit with a wall of just pink. Everything is pink. I hate this section of the store. It is awful. But these are the toys that are marketed to our girl children. Now, 
there's the idea that boys like playing with blocks and girls like playing with dolls and girls are naturally more inclined to nurture and, and that's just normal and that's okay. And so this is just the normal evolution of things. Uh, and it's not true whatsoever. But it's also important because Legos and building blocks, they're not just cool toys to play with. Like that Batmobile isn't just a bitchin' Batmobile. Uh, it helps build spatial reasoning skills. It helps build problem solving skills. So from a tiny age, like I think I bought my son's first Lego set when he was less than two years old. Like pretty much as soon as they can stack blocks, he had Legos. So from that young, I was teaching my son inadvertently how to solve problems, how to do spatial reasoning. Uh, and the m toys that were marketed to my girl child that I bought uh, when she was that age were dolls. I was teaching my daughter how to nurture. And there's nothing wrong with that, per se. But why wouldn't we want to encourage all of our children to do spatial reasoning and problem solving? Um, there's consequently nothing wrong. I have a son that loves dolls, and so he gets dolls. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with teaching our sons to nurture. But I think as parents, and I failed at this too until I kind of woke up and realized it, but as parents, I think we need to be um, cognizant of what it is that we are teaching our children, what we're conditioning them even um, subconsciously to do. Uh, and it is getting a little bit better. There have been things in recent years um, that the trend seems to be improving. So there's a company called Goldie Blocks, which markets to primarily to girls, but it is fairly gender um, neutral toys for hackers. There's also something called Little Bits, which I actually got my daughter for Christmas. It's really cool like components that snap together and they can make all kinds of inventions. Um, but they have very gender neutral marketing. So they're marketing to everyone. But it's important that we all understand that engineering does not have a gender. It, it doesn't. STEM in general does not have a gender and we shouldn't be marketing it in a gendered way. Um, and this isn't a new concept. Uh, if you look at uh, Grace Hopper, Amazing Grace, um, if you look at the very well-known um, woman with her stack of compiled code that like landed the moon land or whatever. Women have been in our industry for a very long time. So the idea that only um, boys appeal to STEM careers or only boys appeal to STEM hobbies is just wrong. Um, once you get past the pipeline though, we have a serious culture problem. And I spend a great deal of this talk talking about that culture problem because I think that it gets um, less service than the pipeline problem, and it is a bigger issue. I see two kinds of discrimination. So there's one kind of discrimination that it's ex explicit. This stuff is really gross and dangerous, but it's also usually really easy to spot. These include things like death threats, rape threats, hate speech, doxing. I don't know if you see the same kind of Twitter that I see, but I've seen some really atrocious things on Twitter. And I am fairly well addicted to Twitter. I use it pretty constantly. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I tweet a lot. Um, and when my phone goes off to this day, I've been on Twitter for like a, almost a decade. When my phone goes off and someone tweeted me, I get kind of excited, like yay, somebody on the internet talked to me, that's amazing. Let's go see what they said. And I can only imagine what it feels like to feel that buzz in my pocket and take my phone out and have some random stranger on the internet telling me that they want to murder me or rape me or having my personal information that I didn't authorize put out on the internet. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with doxing, doxing is the practice of posting your personal and private information on the internet, things like your address, your parents' address, your phone numbers. Uh, and you can understand how that is a serious security risk. Like that puts you in literal physical danger, specifically when combined with randoms on the internet threatening to kill you. And I talk, like I said, I've given this talk about a dozen times. I talk very loudly on the internet about diversity and inclusion and its importance, but I am also a father. And I can tell you that the second somebody posts my address, the address of my children on the internet, I would be scared and I would probably shut up. And a lot of these women have had to do that. 
Um, and I'm not saying that it's only women that are doxxed, but I've seen personally a number of women doxxed, a number of women who have had to go to a friend's house and call the police because somebody put their address in tandem with a death or rape threat on the internet. The implicit kind, the second kind is implicit. It's insidious, it's ingrained in a lot of us. It's really hard to see, it's even harder to point out. Uh, and I struggle a lot with trying to decide, how do you talk about this? Because a lot of times on a one-off, um, in isolation, these things seem like no big deal. And so you, when you try to point them out and when you try to explain them to people, you get a lot of, well, like, grow a thicker skin. It's not a big deal, slough it off. So I've compiled some things that you hear as a female developer. Uh, and these things are all things that either I've heard personally or close friends of mine have heard directly. This one I got. I got a lot in a lot of different variations. But the idea that like you're a developer and you're a girl, you're a unicorn. I've been called a unicorn on more than one occasion and it's weird. This one I got from a colleague who was paying me a compliment. He was being nice to me. And he told me, you're the first woman I've ever worked with, and I'm impressed by how competent you are. Now, I'm a very competent engineer. You know, not to toot my own horn. I'm good at what I do, and I enjoy what I do. But what he was saying here was that when I first met you, because you're a lady person, I assumed you were incompetent. And I'm delighted to find that that's not the case. And after I got over my initial dislike of this, it took probably an hour for me to explain to him why that was deeply offensive. And he kept going to be like, no, I'm being nice. No, I'm, I'm giving you a compliment. I'm saying a nice thing. Why don't you just accept the compliment? Because it's a backhanded compliment. Uh, you're a pretty good coder for a girl. If ever you feel the need to suffix any sentence with for a girl, please don't. Just, just stop. <laughs> Girls don't like to solve problems. Now this one I actually got from uh, an article that I read. Um, it was Google a few years ago did a, a Girls Who Code type event where they were trying to encourage um, girls in, in, in STEM, um, which was a great event. It was, it was a little pink washed, and I'll talk about pink washing later. But um, there was a, it might have been TechCrunch, was doing an interview with one of the organizers of this. And the interviewer said, you know, girls don't like to solve problems, so how are you planning to get around that? And at that point, I just stopped the video, full stop, I'm done with you. What are you even doing? That is not true. Girls make great front end developers because they like to make things pretty. Now, I was a senior backend engineer at a company, a small startup, uh, probably about four or five of us on the team. Um, and our CTO, or sorry, CFO, the man who signed my paychecks every week, the man who paid me money, uh, we had hired a new accountant, and he was walking around introducing the new accountant to everyone. And he came to my desk, and he said, this is so-and-so, uh, she makes things pretty. I couldn't front end my way out of a box. Like, I'm fairly competent to bootstrap some things sometimes, but it is not my forte. Um, and, you know, I was kind of irritated by this because the, the guy who signs my paycheck has literally no idea what I do for his company, which is irritating. Uh, but when I, when I mentioned it offhandedly to my boss about how irritating this was, my boss told me this. Uh, he's like, well, you probably just assume you're a front end developer because you're a girl. Girls make great front-end developers. They like making things pretty. Which is not true. It's not only offensive to women. Uh, it is offensive to front-end developers. Because what they do is magic, and I couldn't do it if I wanted to. I'm a very good back-end developer. I'm good at writing APIs, but I couldn't make things pretty if I tried. So things that you experience um, as a female developer. Missing promotions. This is not to say that women expect that they should be promoted because they're women. That is not what that is saying. We're not trying, they, they are not trying to steal promotions from the well-deserving white men in the industry. 
But I've seen on multiple occasions women who have been at the company longer, who have been in their careers longer, who have done the job better, not only get missed for promotions, in one exact case, there was a woman who had been there longer, like since the company was founded almost, uh, who had been in her career longer, wasn't even told the promotion was available, and they promoted some other guy who had been there for less amount of time. And it happens over and over and over again. And there are a lot of people who will say, well, that's just because women aren't as aggressive. Women don't ask for the promotion. Women don't ask for the raise. Women don't demand it, and men do. They're assertive. And that's ridiculous. Uh, women are less likely to ask for promotions. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't get them if they're qualified. Being talked over in meetings. This is infuriating. And I can tell you from both sides of the fence. It's really funny. I used to get talked over in meetings all the time. I'd be saying something, and someone would just start talking over me. And I don't think that they were trying to be a jerk. They probably didn't even realize they were doing it, but they did it repeatedly over and over and over again. And then a funny thing happened. I started taking testosterone and my voice dropped into a nice manly range and nobody interrupts me anymore. They don't talk over me in meetings. It's a really weird phenomenon. I was surprised the first few meetings I went through. Well, no one talked over me. Nobody interrupted me. Um, there's also a, a really prevalent thing that happens that I've had happened to me and I've seen happen to other people where a woman will say, blotty, 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 really insightful thing, and everyone will go, no, no, no. And then a man sitting next to her will say, blotty, 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 slightly reworded, exact same insightful thing, and everyone will go, yes, absolutely, that is exactly what we're looking for. And the, the woman is just left to go, wait, what? No. Like, I just said that. Literally, same thing. But his idea was better. You are always either aggressive or whiny. There is no in-between. Uh, you're, it's just the way it is. Like you're either being uh, a jerk when you raise or you're just being too sensitive. Have you tried being less sensitive? As in my case, you were immediately uh, assumed incompetent. And sexual harassment. This happens an inordinate amount. I worked with a woman and we had someone on her staff tell her he was really happy that she worked here because he liked tall women. What? Could you imagine going into your office and having someone tell you like, I'm really glad you work here. I like buff men. No, that's gross and it's wrong and it shouldn't happen, but women have to put up with this sort of stuff all the time. Um, I've been, you know, asked to go home and change because I was wearing a jean, like jeans and a t-shirt and that wasn't appropriate attire for the office, even though all the other men were wearing jeans and t-shirts and I just happened to be a lady person wearing the same thing. Um, that sort of stuff, you get scrutinized for the way you look when really you're just trying to do a job. And so when you try to point out these things in isolation, um, except for the really egregious ones. A lot of people will tell you that it's not a big deal uh, to grow a thicker skin, to toughen up. But when you get this every day, every week, 10 times a day, 10 times a week, it's not a, not a little thing anymore. Like how much do you just have to shake off to continue doing your job? You see this stuff in recruiting. Um, so I don't know why job descriptions need pronouns and genders. They shouldn't have them, but oftentimes they do. How many times have you read a job description where under the like, our ideal candidate section, and they say, he has a willingness to this, and he has a passion for that, and he has a passion for this, and you're gonna tell me, oh, that's silly. It's just pronouns, it's just words, it doesn't matter. Flip it around. If you read a job description as a man that said, she has this, and she has that, would you apply for that job? Or would you immediately say, well, they're obviously not talking to me? And the thing is, the pronoun doesn't add anything to the job description, it just excludes half the population. You can say they have, and then you're talking to everyone. And it's those kinds of tiny things that you don't think about. Probably the person writing the job description, I would hope, was not intentionally excluding women. But it happens. 
marketing. So much marketing. Uh, a lot of times tech products are marketed directly at men. A lot of times tech market products are dr marketed directly at men using women as props. If you've ever seen a GoDaddy ad, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's gross, uh, it's offensive to women, it's probably, I, I mean, I find it as a man offensive to men because that's not how you're going to get me to open my wallet and it's gross that you think that that's the way to do it. Uh, you see this in advertisements, you see it also, I've never been to a conference that uses a booth babe, but I know they exist and I've seen them. That sort of marketing is disgusting and should never happen. Also mansplaining. A lot of people will tell you that mansplaining doesn't exist. For anyone who doesn't know what mansplaining is, mansplaining is the act of uh, explaining something to a woman that she already knows, essentially. I actually have a funny example of this. Now, I grabbed this screenshot after I transitioned, so the name is wrong, but you can see my Twitter handle was still my old handle when it happened. I tweeted, as a senior backend engineer at, or I might have been a staff engineer at this point. Anyway, at a, as, as a high-level engineer at a large media company in New York, I tweeted, when in doubt, pseudo chmod777. To which someone replied, nope, when in doubt, man this, man that, man this. And then also try Googling this. Now, I don't know any senior engineers in their right mind, man or woman, who actually think that pseudo chmod 777 is a good idea or that we should be doing this. This guy mansplained me with actual man pages. <coughs> there was a very similar tweet that went out a few weeks later from a man and everyone was like, huck, 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 that's so funny. No one would actually do that. But me, I got this. Um, my, uh, my wife, who is a woman uh, in tech, she's a engineering manager at Etsy now, um, had tweeted something not too long ago about handwriting down um, GitHub hashes so that she could remember them. Uh, again, a funny joke, this woman's been in tech for 20 years. She's a very renowned speaker and very successful in her career. And somebody tweeted her and was like, haha, don't you know GitHub has tags? Well, yes, yes, she, she did know that. But thank you for telling her, that's helpful. Male privilege. Um, and this is another thing that's really hard to explain. I spent 28 years of my life as uh, a woman. And the last year, um, I transitioned and somebody gave me a nice bundle of male privilege, which still feels really uncomfortable for me. Like I'm not super excited about all of the male privilege that I get. Uh, but the most succinct way that I can think to describe what male privilege is, is if you've never had to deal with anything on the previous slides, you have it. For the majority of you, you were born with it. And your lives are made much easier by having it. Now there's the hashtag not all men, which I find to be an interesting sentiment. You see this also when people talk about um, race diversity. And you'll say, like, black lives matter. Well, all lives matter. So when a minority is creating a safe space for themselves, it's not a threat to the majority. Um, I don't know any feminists or anyone, uh, really, who thinks that all men are bad. Nobody does. I don't. I'm a man. I don't know any other person who does. Um, the fact that some men do this doesn't mean that all men do this. But when you knee-jerk react with not all men, you're ignoring the problem. All the focus has been taken off of the problem. All the focus has been taken off of fixing the problem. And you're just fixated on the idea of, well, that's not me, so what you're saying isn't true. When what they're saying, what we're saying, what I'm saying is very true. And everyone understands that not everyone does it. Okay, but why does all this matter anyway? What's the big deal? So what do you do for a living? I'm going to assume that if you're at a developers conference, that most of you in this room are developers, or at least developer adjacent. And what we do is magic, like this kind of magic. 
Think about it. You sit down to a computer and you smash on some keys writing stuff that is completely incomprehensible to any layman. And if you've ever had to show one of your non-technical friends or relatives what you do for a living, you understand that. Uh, and then you throw it at the internet and the internet says, okay, here's, here's, a, here's a usable thing. Here's a thing that's going to make somebody money, that's going to save somebody time, that's going to make their lives easier. What we do is absolute magic. And you probably felt that the first time you ever wrote something that actually compiled after hours of trying to make it work. Uh, the first time you fixed a bug and it worked. The first time, lo and behold, you ever wrote something like front to back and it worked the first time. You know that feeling? That, oh, I'm a god, right? And how privileged are we to do this? Not only are we magicians that get to do really awesome stuff every day, but software engineering careers are flexible. Um, I don't, I, I'm a little bit jet lagged, but I'm pretty sure today's Friday. Is that right? Yeah, it's Friday. Okay. So this is a working day. I'm not at work. Uh, I'm actually in a, a beautiful foreign country on a stage speaking to all of you. Um, I'm assuming that most of you here probably have jobs that you're not at today because you're here. That's awesome. Um, you know, I take time off when I need time off. And my employer is completely okay with that. Um, we actually at my company have unlimited vacation. And one of, one of the few companies I've ever seen that actually, that means unlimited vacation. They actually mandate that we take at least three days a quarter to force us to take vacation. Sorry. Um, but that's not uncommon in our industry. A lot of people work remote. Like you can work from your living room. You can work from a beach if you want to. Most people do not have that at all. Our jobs are really high paying. Uh, really? Okay, we'll come to America. Everyone come to New York. Uh, okay, well, maybe should have looked that up. Uh, <laughs> In the US, developer careers are very high paying. Um, and in high demand, is that not true here either? Okay. So I don't know about you, but I get a lot of LinkedIn messages and Twitter and email where they're like, let me give you a job, let me give you a job. Are you looking for a job? Do you want a job? Uh, in New York, the recruiters are ruthless. They will call you up and be like, so do you like your job? Uh, you know, are, do they cover your health insurance? Like, do you have a spa at your office? Like, what can we give you? Do you have free drinks? You know, do you have happy hours? What is it that you need to try to get you into a job? Uh, and the funny thing is, we have so much privilege about this because I have not met a developer that doesn't complain about it. So you'll get an, an email, you'll be like, oh God, these recruiters won't leave me alone. This is so annoying. Now you go talk to somebody else not in tech and complain to them about someone trying to give you a job. Because in like every other industry in the world, people like pull out classified ads and go on monster.com to try to find jobs. They don't have people knocking on their doors saying, hi, would you like to come be an accountant for my company? And so to go work for it. Now the next few slides are not going to mean anything to you apparently because the stats are not reciprocal over here. But this is the median household income in the US. This is the average annual salary for a software engineer in the US. Uh, this is the average annual salary for a software, uh, for a senior software engineer. <laughs> and we're just gonna go through these real quick because apparently it doesn't translate. In the US, uh, Baseline software engineers are 47% over the median income. Senior software engineers are almost 100% over. And we're all 326% above the poverty level. Moving on. <laughs> what are we going to tell our kids? I mentioned at the beginning of this that I'm a daddy. I was not lying. Those are mine. They're adorable. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, I have uh, the one in the middle there is Lydia. She's 11. Uh, the tiny one is five, his name is Sean, and the slightly larger boy is uh, seven, his name is Matthew. And I love these three little people more than I ever thought it was possible to love anyone. Uh, and I look at them and I've spent my entire life 
you know, I had Lydia when I was 18, literally my entire adult life, being their parent and working my butt off to be successful and to make enough to provide them with everything I didn't have as a kid. I grew up as a very poor child in a trailer park in a tiny little town, uh, and I didn't have a lot of things. And, you know, having children is the reason why I do what I do. When I had Lydia, I was not a software engineer. I worked at a call center, uh, and I worked really hard to put myself to, through school to get a successful career. You know, and now I live in New York City, uh, and I make enough to support my family and give them everything that I never had as a kid. And I remember what my dad used to say to me when I was a kid, when I was a little girl. And it was a lot of like, keep your chin up, kid. Grow a thick skin. Don't let them tell you that they, you can't. You can do this. And now that I'm a father and I'm looking at my daughter, I don't want to say that. I refuse to say that. I refuse to look at my three children and say, you can do anything you want. Well, you too. You are going to need to grow a thick skin. You're going to need to try harder. You're going to need to persevere. You're going to need to not let them get you down. And you shouldn't let anyone tell you that you can't. I don't want to say that. I'm pretty sure that all the fathers in the room, if there are any fathers, don't want to say that to their daughters. We shouldn't have to. So when I started giving this talk a couple years ago, uh, we had 11 years, I think, to get ready. Now we have fewer. She's 11. She'll be an adult in seven years. So we have seven years to get ready because by the time my daughter is old enough, if she wants to come into this industry, I don't want her to have to deal with all the crap that all the women that I know have had to deal with. For my daughter and for every other daughter out there, we need to get better. And for the women that are already among us, we need to get better. They don't deserve this. It's also the concept of in, uh, invisible minorities. <coughs> so you can usually tell when somebody is a person of color, when someone is a woman. It's pretty easy to see. But there's an invisible minority that you can't see. Um, I suffer from anxiety and bipolar disorder. I was diagnosed when I was 14. I've been medicated on and off for this for a lot of my life. Um, I have made four suicide attempts. The most recent one was in 2014. Um, that suicide attempt was really directly uh, correlated to some pretty severe burnout. But you don't know the struggle that someone had to go to to get where they are. And where they are could be, you know, where they are in their career, but it could also be just at work on a random Wednesday. There have been several days where it takes literally everything I have to get out of bed in the morning and go to work, where I'm holding on by my fingernails to just keep it together. And you don't want to be the jerk that is you know, just adding on to that. You don't need to. You don't know what someone had to go through for something as simple as just getting on a conference call. For some people, it's really difficult. And we need to be conscious of that. And the toxicity in our industry definitely contributes. It's also something called imposter syndrome. Um, if anyone, I think most people are familiar with imposter syndrome. Uh, but it's the, the feeling that you're faking it, that any success you have is due to luck, and that you don't really know what you're doing. Um, I feel this. I know a lot of people that feel this. Um, this is definitely not just for women and minorities. Uh, but studies show that imposter syndrome is more prevalent in women and person, uh, people of color. Possibly because you know women face being thought or being immediately assumed incompetent pretty constantly. I have this idea of a worth it scale. So you have pros and cons. And when you first start your career, you have a lot of pros. Like, again, this is magic. And I have a ton of passion for what I'm doing. And I'm learning so much. And I'm problem solving. And everything is amazing. And then you start getting disrespected. And you get tired. And you get harassed. And then you start to doubt yourself. And eventually, the scale tips. And women leave our industry at nearly two times the rate of men. 
So not only do we have a bad pipeline where they're not getting in, once we get them here, they leave because we're jerks to them. And that's not okay. So what can you do about this? This is not a woman's problem. It's not a minority's problem. It's also not a man's problem. This isn't everybody's problem. We are all being hurt by it, and we can all help fix it. And I mean it when I say we're all being hurt for, by it. Even if you've never noticed that there was a problem, you're impacted by it. And you don't need to be a minority to empower minorities. Um, you can do things, advocacy, empowerment, encouragement. These things are achieved through sincere one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions. Now, before I talk about any other solutions, there are some anti-solutions, which are a lot like anti-patterns in software. I think we've all had some experience with those. These things look or sound really, really good. They don't actually solve any problems, and they might actually do more harm than they do good. So the shiny unicorn syndrome. Uh, again, <laughs> as a female developer, I was called a unicorn on more than one occasion, or treated to be like super duper special. It's really annoying, really annoying. I've had a friend that was the first female hire for her company, and she was super excited to join this company. Uh, you know, everything was great until the marketing team was like, let's do like an expose on you because you're our first female hire and this would look really good for diversity. <laughs> no, no, please don't make me your token trophy lady developer. Nobody wants that. Kitty gloves, also not a solution. So I had um, an experience where I was on a team and we used to do group, group code reviews once a week. So we would all come into this meeting with a piece of code we'd written put it up on the projector, and then we do like a, a group code review. And my boss at this job was kind of a jerk. He was just an atrocious jerk. Uh, and one of my fellow developers, who happened to be a man, put his code up there, and my boss just ripped him apart. Like, this is awful, and what were you thinking, and this is stupid, and all this. And then I put my code up on the screen, and he looks at it, and he rubs his chin, and he says, well, you tried. What? You're not going to make me cry. First, don't be a jerk when you do code reviews, but if you're going to be a jerk, at least be a jerk to everyone. <laughs> Pink washing. I mentioned this um, a little bit before when I was talking about the Google event, but it's this idea that like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, but sorry. Um, this idea that like, oh, we can get girls into tech if we just make everything pink. Um, so we'll teach them how to make like super high connected bracelets or, or they can make dresses that are connected to the internet and then they'll love it. That's ridiculous. <laughs> girls like solving problems. Big girls, little girls, we like, they like solving problems. Give them problems. You don't need to make it pink. You don't need to make it about babies or dresses or how to make the internet of lipstick. It doesn't need to happen. You can just make them excited about solving problems. Quotas are bad, very, very bad. If you ever organize an event or are in charge of hiring, please do not implement a quota. It's gross. Um, it is hard enough for women to get up on stage uh, to speak at an event and you never want to be the woman on stage and have an in, you know an audience of two or three hundred people who are wondering if you're up there to fill the lady quota. No woman wants to do that. They want to be on stage because they're talented, because they're good at what they do, because <coughs> they've worked hard. And they have. They are all of those things, and they deserve to be on stage just as much as a man does, but definitely not specifically just to fill a quota. So the Code Manifesto. Um, which is essentially what this talk is about, is something that I wrote a few years ago. Um, and it's not a solution to the problem. It's not a light switch. If there were a light switch solution to this problem, I would hope that it would have already been solved and I wouldn't be up here talking to you today. Um, but it's something that I wrote. I had an idea that if we all just agreed to act better, the things would get better. So 
It's about values and not actions. The first draft I wrote of this was actually about actions. It was do this and do this and don't do that. Um, and I had a friend read over it and he said, you know, it's a lot easier to get people to incorporate values into their lives than it is to get them to do and do not do, do things. So it started out, I believe, as six values. Uh, it is an open source project and there have been a couple more contributed. So now that it's eight values and there are two major themes, respect, this is the idea that we want to improve our existing culture and giving back and looking forward, which ideally would help with the pipeline problem. So the first one is first because it is in my mind the most important. Discrimination limits us. Immediately disqualifying more than half of the population is nothing short of insane. It's ridiculous. The fact that we do this, whether consciously or subconsciously, is just silly. And this includes discrimination on all sorts of bases. And this is another uh, good example of open source because when I wrote this, this statement was much shorter because again, I don't have experience with all the kinds of discrimination that are faced. And people made contributions and pull requests to expand it because they had faced discrimination on, on different facets. Boundaries honor us. So boundaries are healthy and everybody has them and we need to respect them. And occasionally throughout life, you're going to cross a boundary because your boundaries are not the same as someone else's. And when they tell you that you crossed the boundary, you do the normal human thing and say, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. Not grow a thicker skin. We are our biggest assets. So none of you were born geniuses. Uh, I wasn't, Steve Jobs wasn't, Mark Zuckerberg certainly wasn't. Uh, we all learned this. We were all helped along the way, helped by the people who came before us, helped by the people who are our peers, and we should return that favor when and where we can. There's a lot of ways to do this. Write a blog post, answer something on Stack Overflow, make a screencast, start a podcast, give a talk, make a pull request. Um, any of these things are ways to help and to give back. And I think it's important that we all try to make it a priority to do that. We are resources for our future. So this one is really scary to me, but as you know, we in the industry now look up to people like Jobs and Zuckerberg or further back, you know, people like Alan Turing and Grace Hopper. Um, those are our raw models. Those are who we learn from. All of you are that for the next generation. Uh, people are going to look up to you and we need to be mindful of that. We need to be worthy of that. Make yourself a resource for others. One of the things that I love most about being a senior engineer is that I get to uh, mentor younger engineers, junior engineers, not always younger, junior. Um, and that's really powerful to me. I strongly believe that the most important deliverable of a senior engineer is more senior engineers. If you're not better for having worked with me, then I'm not doing my job. Respect defines us. This is one of those silly things that like really we shouldn't have to say, but we kind of do because there's a problem, but it's just treat others the way you want to be treated. Make your discussions uh, from a place of respectfulness. I ask myself this all the time. Um, doesn't always pass, but um, ask yourself, is this true? Is it necessary? And is it constructive? And Anything less should be intolerated. Now, this is something that I see people, yeah, probably in 80 to 90% of the time will do in person. If you're having a face-to-face -face discourse, you are much less likely to be a jerk. But guess what? We spend most of our day talking to the internet. And just because you're behind a keyboard doesn't mean you need to be less respectful than you would be face-to-face. -face. If you wouldn't say this thing to somebody's face, don't type it. Reactions require grace. So, Developers seem to have an instinct to turn it up to 11. Um, somebody did a stupid thing, whether that's a culturally stupid thing or a code stupid thing. You know, you broke Semver when you released a package. Up to 11. You did a really bad thing at a conference one time when you were drunk and you were stupid. Like, turn it up to 11. That's not helpful. So things, I mean, it's okay to be curious. It's okay to be passionate. It's okay to have a love for what you do. It's not as okay to immediately respond with hate and anger and burning everything with fire. It's not helpful. 
Opinions are just that, they're opinions. Uh, you know, everyone has one. Opinions, elbows, things like that. Everyone has one. This one actually um, contributed by a fellow on Twitter called Artisan Goose. And it's to encourage an environment where people understand that every person is different in more ways than one. So we're allowed to have our opinions. Our opinions are allowed to differ. Everyone's going to have an opinion, and that is okay. And to err is human. Some errors are just errors. You made a pro you made a mistake. It happens. And we all need to be able to make mistakes. When we're not able to make mistakes, people don't try. If you immediately think that you're going to be shot down or screamed at or that the community as a whole is going to turn it up to 11 against you because you did a stupid thing, you're not going to be willing to make mistakes. And really, the entire internet and all of technology is made of mistakes. Somebody made a mistake because they tried something that they weren't expecting, and it turned out to be brilliant, and it worked, and now you know we have this amazing technology. But hatred rarely inspires growth. So if you immediately respond with hate, if you immediately respond by turning things up to 11 and just calling for someone's head, they're not going to, they're not going to learn anything. They're not going to change their behavior. Uh, and that's understandable. That's human. If I did a stupid thing and immediately people are just witch hunting for me, It's, it's a rare person that will sit down and go, you know, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I was wrong. The knee-jerk reaction is to be like, no, stop it. You're being wrong. But supporting the Code Manifesto isn't enough. So there is a website you can go to, codemanifesto.com, and it has this, uh, the manifesto written out. It has, I think we have eight or nine different translations that have been um, contributed by the community because I'm a dumb American and I only speak English. Um, there's also a thing where you can go and put in your name and your Twitter handle and it'll list you on a page of supporters. And there are several hundred supporters to this now. But that's cheap. How many times a day do you go and enter your name and email address or Twitter handle into a form and click submit and then completely forget about it? You have to live it. Remember it. Keep it top, keep it top of mind. Try to incorporate these values into what you're doing. And that's easy for me. I mean, I wrote it so I can think about it every day. Um, I think about it you know, before I send tweets or before I, or I do a code review. I think about it when I'm at work and I'm interacting with my colleagues, when I'm mentoring. Um, but it's important that everyone else keep it top of mind too. So there are other things you can do. Stand up. When you hear or see somebody doing a jerk thing, being overtly or implicitly discriminatory. Stand up. Uh, it's going to take a lot of the majority standing up when they see wrongs. And it's not an easy thing to do. You know, I've been at work and you've seen, seen someone talking over other people in meetings. And you say, hey, like, she was speaking. Stop it. You know, I've been at work and seen a guy having a conversation with a woman where he was doing like this. This, this hand chop thing, which is super offensive to me. Like, it's, it's very dad voice, and nobody wants to be dad voiced at work. You know, it doesn't have to be right then, but pull that guy aside later and say, hey, so this is not okay at work. Don't hand chop people in conversations. Don't do it. Um, I have seen an interaction where a guy asked a f uh, one of our female developers, and again, we work on a LAMP stack, asked her, do you know SQL? Well, of course she does. She's worked here for two years. Like, just don't ask that question. It's really offensive. And so you take them aside after the, after the fact, and you say, hey, like, this is a problem. You shouldn't do this. This is offensive. And it's not always easy, but it's important. Know your bias. So everybody has one or more. And they're not, it's not bad that you have a bias because your bias has been gained through all of your life experiences, from your childhood, from your parents, from your culture. Everyone's going to have one. You're not going to get out of life without one. But you need to know them and understand them. And for me, um, you know, it was really easy for me at the beginning to be like, oh, I don't have any biases. Like, I'm super woke. Uh, but then I started thinking about it. I was in a hiring capacity uh, or part of a hiring team at a job. 
And I realized that the second an older white gentleman walked in, I immediately thought like, oh, you clearly know Peach before, you know, you're not hip on the new practices, you know, you haven't, you know, you're not up to date. So clearly you're not gonna be a good fit. And that is absolutely just as ridiculous as people discounting a woman when she walks in the room. And I had to realize that and actively try to fight it. Own your privilege. And this one's hard because, like I said, I mean, I grew up poor. I worked really hard to get where I'm at. When somebody told me to own my privilege, I immediately was like, no, I worked for what I have. I don't have privilege. But the fact is that I do. Uh, I spent, you know, most of my career as a woman in tech, which, you know, has its own discrimination, but I was a white woman in tech. You know, there is privilege that I get from that. The best illustration I've seen for privilege would be if you can imagine if I put a trash can right here and I gave you all balls of paper and I said, throw it in there. Now, for these people in the front row, you could probably do it fairly simply. Like, it wouldn't be super hard depending on how good your hand eye coordination is. The people in the back of the room, though, impossible. Like, they're never going to get it. Uh, they're going to try really hard for it. They're going to be Michael Jordan of paper tossing to get that. And so it doesn't mean that the people in the front row have, don't have a hard job, but unless you turn around and see who's behind you, you're never going to understand how hard other people might have it. So owning your privilege isn't about discounting your struggle or the trouble that you've had to go through to get where you are. It's understanding that it might be harder for everyone sitting behind you in the auditorium. And there's things that we can do to help those behind us. Work to educate yourself. Now, you get a lot of times, and I get this on a lot of different facets. Uh, I get it for being a trans man. Uh, I get it for being a woman. But where people will ask you questions about, like, what's it like to be a woman in tech? You know, can you give me trans 101? Like, what is, what is the trans exactly? Um, and for me, for most times, I will answer these questions. I actually have a compiled list of resources that I keep on my laptop. And so when someone ans an asks me a question, I normally will give them a link and say, you can go read about this here and here and here. But it is amazing the amount of times you get asked these questions. And they're usually the same questions. So it is not abnormal to ask a question and have someone tell you to do your own research. And that's because these women and minorities have been asked the same question you know, every day, every week. It gets tiring. They don't owe you their time or their energy to answer your questions. And it's important to try to educate yourself and to take it gracefully if they tell you to do your own research. Um, and once you've educated yourself, help educate others. You can spread the knowledge that you gain. Once you understand a little bit more about discrimination and diversity, you can help educate others. This next one's really important and also really hard. Shut up. Uh, and amplify the voices of others. Help give a platform to people um, that could use it. All right. Thank you.